this study evaluates two hypotheses. Firstly, that there's an increased risk of ocular injury with specific fracture patterns. And secondly, that there's an increased risk of ocular injury with specific mechanisms of injury. The objectives of doing this study are that by obtaining these data, one may be able to distinguish which patients with periorbital facial fractures will require ophthalmologic assessment prior to facial fracture repair. The study design is shown in Figure 1, in which the authors start with 1,976 studies from the literature and pair them down to 11 studies that meet their inclusion criteria, 10 of which are retrospective and one of which is prospective. They identify six mechanisms of injury to the eye. This can be from direct injury to the eyeball, optic canal injury with injury to the optic nerve, a small bleed into the intramuscular cone, retinal edema or detachment, occlusion of the retinal vessels, and indirect injury to the cerebral cortex or optic chiasm. They also identify seven periorbital fracture patterns, um, including zygomatical maxillary complex fractures, periorbital fractures, of which I critique that this is not very specific, and I would classify all of these as periorbital fractures isolated zygomatic fractures, which again are non-specific, and I think they're speaking of zygomatic arch fractures, isolated maxillary fractures, orbital blowout fractures, Lafort fractures in either a one, two, or three pattern, and nasoet orbital ethmoidal complex fractures, or NLE. The results are shown in table one, and to summarize, of their 11 studies, Ocular or optic nerve injury was seen with an incidence of 9.8 to 29.8%. The single prospective study that looked at this had a 10% incidence of ocular or optic nerve injury. Decreased visual acuity was seen in 0.36 to 7.9%, and loss of vision was seen in 0.7 to 10.8%. Note that the 10.8% loss of vision was from the one study which included penetrating trauma or gunshot wounds. The remaining studies involve blunt trauma with a visual loss of 1.2% or less. In discussing this paper, the levels of evidence of the literature must be considered. Of note is that only one study was a level of evidence two, and this was the prospective study, in which 10% um, of patients had major ocular injuries following zygomatical maxillary complex fractures. The remaining retrospective studies were level of evidence three and four, which consisted of 10 studies, and the data from these were not precise enough to validate whether different fracture patterns are associated with different patterns of ocular injury. So the question remains, were the goals of the study achieved? For hypothesis one, in which they propose that there's an increased risk of ocular injury associated with specific fracture patterns, one would need to re have a series of prospective studies meeting several requirements to answer this question. All patients with facial fractures would need to be classified into the seven specific fracture patterns that they've outlined. Patients with multiple or overlapping fracture patterns would be eliminated to avoid overlap with confounding fracture patterns. And all qualifying patients would need to undergo visual testing immediately upon presentation. And I suggest again at a follow-up interval of at least one month once the edema has resolved. Additional data would need to be recorded for specific operative interventions for the facial fractures, as well as specific ophthalmologic interventions. The second hypothesis, in that there's an increased risk of ocular injury associated with specific mechanisms of injury, again, the data at present are inconclusive. Of note is that the one study in which penetrating trauma was evaluated for gunshot wounds had a 10.8% incidence of visual loss which was significantly higher than the 10 studies in which blunt trauma was evaluated, which had less than 1.2% incidence of visual loss. To answer the question would require a prospective study, and their data suggests that we should segregate patients between um, blunt versus penetrating trauma in distinguishing the mechanisms of injury. The study design would be similar to that proposed for hypothesis one. So finally, does the study design meet the stated objectives? By obtaining these data, one can distinguish which patients with periorbital facial fractures will require ophthalmologic assessment prior to facial fracture repair. However, in order to make this assessment, 
one would need to evaluate the data relative to the final outcomes of patient safety. Firstly, would obtaining this information change the ultimate visual function in the affected patients? And finally, what must compare that outcome to the outcome of obtaining routine ophthalmologic evaluation for all periorbital fractures? One must weigh the relative morbidity of routine ophthalmologic evaluation in all patients with periorbital fractures versus the morbidity of a missed ocular injury. Even if the morbidity of visual loss is less than 1%, it may not justify the risk of not obtaining routine ophthalmologic evaluation for all affected patients. Thank you.